Hi, welcome to MAMP Connects. My name is Jennifer Hutchins, and I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Association of Nonprofits. And today we are celebrating our 30th anniversary. Thank you for being here. And to celebrate, yes, thank you. We're kicking off our fifth season of MAMP Connects with observations about the state of the sector in Maine using some of the the anecdotal evidence that we hear stories and connecting with you, as well as our um, member survey data. Uh, we send out an annual member survey. Many of you, I hope, have already filled it out. Anna is going to be talking about that a little bit later. But even more importantly, is we're going to share, we're going to tell you what we've been hearing. But even more importantly, today in our short forty-five minutes together, I want to find out. We want to hear what's resonating for you. Is is what we're hearing resonating for you? What's what what's missing? What are the big topics that we just haven't picked up on yet? And what's what, and then just what's top of mind. And uh, we've invited to tee up, tee up the conversation. We've invited some of our willing um, friends and members to tee us up, and they'll come on and get, spend a two two or three minutes sharing with uh, with all of us what's resonating for them, what's top of mind for them. And we really encourage you once again comment and chat if you have ideas, if you have questions, if you have concerns. Let us know because we will mine this this today for um, more ways to provide more, um, to fill out all of the observations we have about the sector, because we're here for you. And uh, we. this is how we know what topics to focus on for MAMP Connects and for our other programming. We have great programming all year, and we need to really find out from all of you what you need from us. What are the kinds of things you wanna be learning about, sharing, peer sharing with your, your buddies. And then even more importantly, um, we need to know so that we can advocate for you. We're working really hard in Augusta, Washington, DC with our friends at the National Council of Nonprofits, as well as um, business leaders and philanthropic leaders to make sure we're sending the right messages to them about what you need in the charitable nonprofit sector. So this is a really important day, but let me make sure you know that the conversation does not end today. This is really just a reminder to all of you that we're always here to listen. And MAMP Connects 2024 is going to provide many opportunities for these conversations to continue. We're going to change up the format a little bit. The exciting news is that we're going to do two in-person MAMP Connects this year. We had December's um, MAMP Connects that went off so beautifully, and we want to try to pick up that energy and carry it forward into 2024. So um, look out for that. We haven't picked the locations yet, but we promise they will not only be in Southern Maine, and uh, we'll be having two in-person and MAM kicks and two virtual ones. So stay tuned for that. Um, now, let me get us grounded a little bit. Let's remember that MAP Connect started in April 2020 at a time that was exceptionally difficult for all of us. And it was really just an opportunity for to get all of you the information that you needed as soon as possible. And it's really evolved into this consistent space where we can come together and talk about critical issues that we share and hear about the challenges and opportunities from the people, the partners, and the professionals who make up this amazing um, sector of people with purpose is what we like to say. And then most importantly, probably that gets sometimes get undervalued. It's a hard thing to quantitate it by any stretch. But what we keep hearing and we know that it helps, know it helps for us at MAMP Central is knowing we're not alone, right? And um, we are here to, to tell you you're not alone in Maine and you're not alone in the nation. Uh, we are members of the National Council of Nonprofits. I recently became a board member of the National Council of Nonprofits and I'm really committed to bringing to you reflections from other parts of the country and the national data that the National Council has so that you know you're part of a broader network. Through the National Council, all of our members are part of a, a network of nonprofits across this country that are is over three 35,000 organizations strong. And so I just want you guys to know that and feel that. Okay, um, this is a great way to kick off. Um, we are gonna, uh, I need to thank our consistent and amazingly supportive, generous sponsors, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. They're a nonprofit themselves. What a genuine team of leaders here in the community. Thank you, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. And now I'm going to kick it over to our, our board chair, 
Um, Shira Patterson, she is the president and CEO of Heart of Maine United Way, and I'm just so excited you're here with us this morning, Shira. Want to kick us off with some observations? Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me. I am just so thrilled to be here with you all this morning and um, be able to represent the MAMP board and let you know that we have an incredible board of directors at MAMP. We are very dedicated and engaged with the work and happy to support the incredible staff team we have behind us um, leading our work in the state. And um, I want to express my gratitude to all of you that are members of MAMP and have been for many, many years um, and for our newest members. But, you know, we're here for you. And um, just as Jen said, you know, we want to learn from you, we want to support you, and we want to advance, most importantly, advance the work of the sector as a whole. And I've been on the board for a long time. I've been on the board, I was just thinking this morning, my young, my oldest son is 10, and um, I was pregnant with him when I started on the board. So I've seen a lot with MAMP, and I've grown in my leadership through serving on the MAMP board. So I'm really grateful for that. But um what I'm really proud of today is that we are embracing our role to um, fully champion the sector, but more import importantly, those partnerships that are important and <clears throat> leading when we need to lead and being a supportive partner when we need to be a supportive partner to really, um, to really, really help advance and elevate nonprofits throughout the state of Maine, no matter what uh, area you're working in. And, um, you know, at Heart of Maine United Way, we are one of seven United Ways in the state of Maine. And if you don't know, United Ways, although we're part of a global network, we're all independent 501c3s locally operated, and um, we have our own missions and visions. But in the state of Maine, we work really closely together. Um, one of the issues that I see at, at my organization, and I'm sure you all, <laughs> many of you can relate, is just really, really focusing on supporting our workforce. Um, keeping strong cultures in our workplaces and retaining talent because competition is strong. And so how do we keep our top talent uh, to support our missions? And we've worked really hard of that at Heart of Maine United Way and being able to learn from MAMP and our other partners um, and folks like you to be able to do that is just so important. And I'm really grateful for that. And I would say, um, you know, Jen touched on advocacy, but if you're not tapped into the advocacy work that we're doing at MAMP, tap in. Um, it's incredible. And there's a powerhouse, um, not only at the staff level, but uh, a strong group of volunteers that are supporting that work. And so, you know, MAMP has so much to offer. Um, uh, even I search the website regularly. The search bar is a handy tool. I just did it yesterday. I was looking for uh, fiscal sponsorship agreement samples, and I found one. So, um, <laughs> you know, I just want to say thank you again for your membership, your support, and um, just fully take advantage of your membership with MAMP and reach out to the staff if you have questions um, or any of the board members. We're here. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Shira. Thank you so much. We, we really value, um, uh, you know, th there's nothing what I, I teach board rules and responsibilities, we do this webinar, right? And one of the things I remind everyone is the relationship <laughs> between the board chair and the, the chief executive um, is really the heart of the, um, is the heart of the organization and in setting up the culture. And I'm just so grateful that Shira is our chair right now. We have a lot of um, trust and good communication and um, I'm just delighted to be in partnership with you. So thank you, Shira. Um, Anna, I'm really, really pleased to introduce Anna Overstrom Coleman. She is our membership manager. She um, came to May, she came to MAMP um, last year as our membership manager. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Anna, because you have been diving into some of the early results of our member survey, I think. Yes, thank you, Jen. It's really wonderful to be here this morning. Um, I've had um, the chance to welcome a few uh, new MAMP members over the last year, and many of you have welcomed me to MAMP. Um, so I'm really looking forward to continuing to connect um, in the coming months and learning more about the work. 
Um, as you mentioned, Jen, uh, we, um, and as many of you know, every year MAMP um, conducts our member survey as a way of gathering feedback from our 1,000 plus member organizations. Um, we're really interested in learning what MAMP benefits are effective and valuable, as well as whether there's interest in new or developing um, off of existing offerings. And we use this tool also as a way of um, getting a temp check on really what's alive or top priority for you in the current year um, so that we can better align our programming and services to, re to really meet your needs. So one fun highlight of this year's survey is that we have offered it for the first time in French and Spanish, which we hope to con continue to do, not just for our survey, but for other um, um, program offerings. Um, and as Jen mentioned, um, we have extended our MAMP um, survey to uh, the deadline is now Monday, March 18th um, by 5 p.m. Um, so thank you all so much to those who have already completed the survey. We received over 300 responses <clears throat> and we're very grateful for that information. Um, and please feel free to um, uh, I think in member support, we could have, um, if you could email member support, um, if you haven't yet received the link and would like to participate. Um, so once we actually close the survey and have time to really distill all of the data that we receive, we will create a blog post that we'll share back with our membership. But in the meantime, I wanted to just offer a few very key, you know, high, high takeaways from what I'm seeing that I think are relevant for today's conversation. I think first and foremost, we continue to hear that in the aftermath of COVID, demand for our member services is increasing greatly, but as are organizational expenses. Um, you share that the cost of inflation around fuel, rent, housing, food, healthcare is impacting operational budgets as well as salaries and benefits, um, which is what you offer to your greatest asset, your people. Um, and it feels relevant to mention that MAMP is conducting our biannual wages and benefits report this year in 2024. We will let our members know when you um, can participate in the survey, but please a heads up that in fall 2024, um, our report should be out. Um, so despite the increases in both demands for services and operational expenses, we are hearing that funding has still not increased or caught up in a significant way. And I think that that is being compounded by economic uncertainty, or fear of a recession, the many conflicts happening abroad, and that is also impacting giving. So as patterns continue, as funding patterns continue to shift, it's making it really challenging for our nonprofits to, to create viable revenue strategies. Um, and this is a plug for next Thursday, March 28th, MAMP is hosting an event called Revenue Modeling Strategies for Sustainable Growth and Resilience. I would highly recommend checking it out. I think the, the link to that will be in the chat, um, but many of MAMP staff will also be there. So I think it's important to mention that as COVID recedes, just in the past year alone, Mainers are experiencing compounding crises of climate change and gun violence. We've witnessed our members um, grapple with these challenges on a daily basis, adapting and caring, continuing to care for our communities. And we really understand that there's no quick fix or easy solution to these challenges, which is why it feels so important to remember that we are part of this network. And it's our job and, and hope at MAMP that we create opportunities for each of you to reach out to each other directly and see each other as resources. Um, the other big piece that I wanted to mention to everyone here this morning is that um, the top priorities that we're hearing that are front and center for you in this particular moment are leadership fundamentals, government grant writing and contracting, engaging boards and advocacy, and leadership and governance models. So again, this information is just, it's really helpful for us as we shape our programming and services over the coming years. And we're so grateful for your feedback again. Back to you, Jen. Great, thank you, Anna. So again, don't forget that member survey um, and please, please fill it out because it provides the direction that we look for to know how to support you. Um, before I turn it over to some of our, uh, to some of our, our guest, our members who are going to give us some of their reflections, I just want to, um, some of you may be hearing this for the first time, some of those, some of you may, this might be a reminder, um, but the, uh, 
MAMP, uh, it, at the end of 2022, we came out with our impact snapshot, um, having experienced two full years of major turbulence and trying times, we felt that instead of doing a kind of a standard annual report, instead we wanted to give you a reflection back as to what we were seeing as some of the issues rising to the surface for MAMP in term that would guide us, guide a thematic, give us some thematic direction for how to focus our work in the years ahead, given how turbulent things had been in 2020, 21, and 2022. And so I just want to remind you of that impact snapshot. In fact, our um, at our December MAMP Connects, where 340 people came together and heard from leaders in the public, non, um, biz, um, the public nonprofit and philanthropic sectors, talking about effective and equitable partnerships across hmm. sectors to support Maine people was was uh, a keynote for our inspiring change. That's the first topic in our impact snapshot. And that's essentially our advocacy work, um, bringing and knowing that that's, we have to speak up, not just MAMP, but our members as well. And we're really committed to bringing to you a, mo a varied range of um, services and programs to help you advocate as, as along with us as we advocate for you in Augusta and Washington DC and more expansively to, the, to philanthropy and to business. The other four I will mention just quickly, advancing equity, um, we uh, we kicked off a new membership scholarship program um, that has we're really excited has started to be used to increase accessibility for historically disinvested disinvested communities. If anybody's interested in learning more about that, um, please contact Anna. Uh, she would be the one to help you with that. The third one is championing a healthy workforce. Um, Shira already mentioned that for. For Heart of Maine United Way, this is a top issue for them, is retaining staff. And um, we, um, uh, one of the ways that we, we have many ways that we support championing a healthy workforce, but one of the ways I just want to call out is our man Leadership Institute, which builds executive director and CEO skills to manage these, to, to be able to be effective managers and also to build their own professional network with each other um, because that's so helpful. And um, applications, by the way, are open for that program right now. So if you or you know of someone who might be interested in hopping into the Leadership Institute class this year, we're having some in info sessions coming up. So please don't hesitate to check that out. Reimagining strategy is the fourth thing. We have to start thinking about new ways of doing things. What Anna just said, demand is going up. Um, uh, uh, donations have been decreasing, not like the percentage is not horrible, but it's been steady over the last few years. It's getting more challenging on both sides of the equation. And um, and so we have to start thinking more strategically, both within our organizations and across organizations to explore collaboration, to explore how are we gonna solve these, these community problems together. Um, and we, one thing I just want to highlight, we're really proud of a program that we um, launched over the over the pandemic, which is our sounding board program, where you can get um, personalized coaching pro bono as a member. Um, so again, oh, Anna, if you're interested, <laughs> you talk to Anna, who's on the screen. <laughs> I didn't quite realize I was going to be calling you out the whole time. Um, and then lastly, building better boards. I've already pointed out about our board roles and responsibilities we had. Um, we had well over 100 people register last year for our building better our board roles and responsibilities 90 minute webinar to get everybody on the same page about the basics of serving on a nonprofit board. So we're here for you. And now it's your turn to tell us what you need from us. And so the first thing I want to do is a quick temp check because we've got a lot to go through in the next 23, four minutes. Okay, it's now it's your turn. Is it resonating? This is my my little informal in the chat. You have three choices. You can either say yes, or you can say no, or you can go meh. Okay, so you can either type in yes, or you can type in no, or you can type in meh. Meh. And so um, I want to know: is is resonating for you? Are we on the tra right track? 
And there can also be a, you're on the right track and you need to hear this, okay? And so um, uh, keep, be honest, let us know. Yes, and yes, but meh, no, you're way off. Let us know. Okay, temp check so far is pretty good, but I also know that our, our fans are usually the ones who speak up first, right? So the loudest in the choir, right, are the ones who are most excited to be heard. So, okay, good. So yes, please, please add those in. And now I'm going to get to some of the people who agreed to um, share, talk with us this morning. And I'm really excited that Keith Bisson from Coastal Enter CEI, Coastal Enterprises, Inc. Um, he's the president. Keith, I am just so honored that you agreed to come on today and gave us a couple of minutes of your time to tell us what's resonating for CEI. Yeah, well, thanks so much, Jen, and hopefully this is, will be useful, but um, I really appreciate what you all, what you just shared and Anna, those results especially, but first of all, just happy 30th too. I think that's <laughs> yeah. awesome. I think it, it was definitely before my time when I think CEI was one of the co-founders of MAMP. Yes, and, that's right. Um, I still think MAMP plays such a critical role in our nonprofit sector. And I just had a few comments that kind of are a, a mashup a little bit because, you know, I'm president of Coastal Enterprises Incorporated, which is a nonprofit. I serve on a number of boards <clears throat> and have served on a number of boards, um, including, I think I saw someone from Maine, AEYC here. I'm the board oh, president nice. of a nonprofit child care center here in the mid coast. I've served on, I know some people were talking about United Way earlier. I used to serve on that board here in the mid, mid coast and I'm on a, our library board now. And so my comment, and then I've served on some national nonprofit boards too. So a little bit of a mashup. I, I wanted to start with the people one, Anna, because that, you know, is so important to all of us and both the challenges of recruitment and retention um, across the board, you know, I mean, childcare specifically is just brutal right now. And um, that, that'll get to some of my other comments related to compensation and benefits and stuff too. But, um, you know, we've really focused on changing how we hire and in about eight, uh, 15 months ago, brought on a new person um, who's our talent and diversity manager and sort of picked apart our whole recruitment process from how we're advertising for jobs, our job descriptions, how we're interviewing, you know, with kind of this concept of blind interviews and stuff. And it's really had a positive impact on our recruitment process. So I just share that as one example. We also launched a what we're calling a justice fellowship program where we've brought three earlier career individuals on for a full year to work on different projects at CEI. Um, and so that's gonna that's a learning process right now. Mm -hmm. uh, the second piece related to that is compensation and just being competitive, particularly in some of the areas that um, you know are not necessarily why people get into some of our work and I right. Uh, like accounting and finance and yeah. IT and um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, well, human resources too. And yes, it was a very competitive marketplace for for those types of individuals. And so that's been a real challenge. I, I see that across the board. Um, and part of that's it's not only around compensation, but you know we do at CEI anyway. We do try to do pretty regular compensation studies was a third party. We're kind of unique because we have lenders and stuff. So we're competing for people from for-profit entities in many cases. So it's, it sure. requires a little nuance. Um, the third area that I don't think I heard from the engagements or, or the survey results was, um, is technology. And that's, for better or worse, something that I've had to engage in a lot, but it's it's a, that's across the board too, um, in terms of using it, how it's used with, like, things like billing for in a, a childcare setting, for example, and really or the uh, the the U.S. the food program in um, you know free and reduced lunch that you know some childcare providers offer and very administratively burdensome program, but also critical 
to make sure children have access to healthy food, at least, you know, especially when they're in uh, a childcare setting. But, um, but whether it's like accounting systems or in our cases, loan servicing applications or CRMs. Um, Can I uh, ask you a question? Are you yeah. saying that it's um, you need the technology or you need people who know how to work with the Well, technology? both. And I guess okay. th that gets to like the increased cost that yeah. Anna was talking about, like the, right. the costs of these things. I'm, I'm constantly surprised at them because, you know, it's like um, um, you need there are opportunities for efficiencies and automation and stuff. And at the same time to get there, it can be very costly to do that. Right. And so right. getting from here to there is just an area where we might all learn from each other in terms of how to do that. Um, you know, we're only now um, implementing a CRM and I'm, don't ask me why I'm forgetting what that acronym is. It's a uh, customer relationship management system mm -hmm. and which is, you know, extremely valuable from like a fundraising perspective and stuff. And we've still been doing most of that the old fashioned way. And it's, we're a complicated organization in terms of the different things we do. And so getting that stood up has been a lot more work than I anticipated. Um, so I just share that as, as something I think we could learn from each other on. I, yeah, I definitely. definitely don't believe technology is the solution to all of our problems, but sure. there are many benefits to it and opportunities there. And um, it's an area where our nonprofit sector can probably, we can learn a lot from each other. Yeah. Thank you, Keith. Yeah. And some people are mentioning um, artificial intelligence, AI, and the um, effect that that's happening. And that's a hot topic that is being discussed at the National Council of Nonprofits level too. And so um, there are definitely conversations going on. So that's just another angle there. Yeah. The, maybe the last thing, and I, others, I, I'm really looking forward to hearing it from others um, is just the continued, even though the pandemic is sort of over, <laughs> depending how you look at it, um, you know, some, you know, the childcare organization where I'm the board president, we never closed. And because we felt it was important to provide care for people who couldn't work remotely. And fortunately our staff, uh, we're willing to do that. And um, so there's some positions that still can't work remotely. And there's still, a I would say, a healthy tension between um, remote work and being in an office. Definitely. For even those um, organizations that are, like most of our work can be done remotely. And yet we do, Betsy, who's our CEO, and I and our team still see a lot of value and at least some time together from a cultural perspective, you know, I, I at least feel strongly that, you know, one reason we got through the pandemic is because we had a pretty highly developed um, set of relationships that were based on personal interaction and stuff. And I'm not saying you can't do that over remotely, but I, I don't think it can be done entirely remotely. So yeah. just, I'll maybe end with that. Thank you. Right. Keith, that's really, really valuable information. I saw Anna taking a lot of notes. So thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And thanks for supporting MAMP. Um, the next person I'd love to invite is Elise Johansson. She's the executive director of Safe, Joy Vo Safe Voices. Um, Elise, how are you? Oh, I'm great. Good morning. Can you all Good. see me okay? Yeah. How are you? Yeah. Where are you calling us from today? Uh, meaning like physical location? Yeah. Yeah, so I'm at my home in Harpswell. Oh, good. Uh, oh. But typically I work in my, both at my home office and then in Lewiston on Main Street or on um, Lisbon Street. Right, right. I thought you guys were based there. So tell us a little bit, uh, um, Elise, about what you guys are seeing and what, yeah, what are your reflections on this conversation? Yeah, you know, when I was asked, first of all, thank you for asking me to be here. It's yeah, our pleasure. Thank you be with this great group of people from around the state of Maine on this Friday, rainy morning. Um, when I was asked to, to talk at this really wonderful conversation, I really was trying to think of, you know, what are the things that keep resonating, keep bubbling up for me, have been for a long time, and I believe will continue. And so I came up with three of those. So the first one is, how do we collectively um, talk about our work in 
in ways that both are raising up that nonprofits are businesses. I think it's very often that people talk about like the business community and the nonprofits. And I think that we really are an integral part of the fabric of our communities and of our state. You know, I've heard a lot of people talk about, you know, us as employers, paying people the best that we can, creating the best environments that we can. And I think that that is something, you know, I've been con committed to throughout my career, but I think even more since COVID, um, being able to see how we can create a work environment and a culture and an organization where people can perform at excellence, even in the midst of a global pandemic, if you as the employer are creating an environment that attends to their, their wholeness. Yes. Um, and I think we've learned a lot. And, um, and so that, that's one piece of like, how do we show up as we are businesses in the community. We are employers in the community. We are integral to the community and we're not something that's outside of this, this business community and how do we integrate that better? Um, and I've been having conversations in my catchment area about that with some local, um, <clears throat> maybe for-profit businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and then how do we talk? So the other thing is, how do we talk about the work? So I think that, some of us see our work in this like insular, I hate the word silo, but I think that there is some of that, you know, we work in this thing, we're in the field of mental health or we're in the field of economic development or we're in the, the sector of, of um, you know, animal uh, rescue and animal welfare. But in reality, how do we talk about the work that we're doing as, um, as the work that we're attending to these pieces of need in our community and in our um, in our state. Mm -hmm. And I think that will help us um, get through some of what we're seeing, um, which I'm bringing up as the third thing is this funding reality. So yeah. all of our expenses have gone up. All of our funding has either gone down or plateaued. And so what we're doing is we're doing the same amount of work, actually more with less people because we are choosing to pay people really well and not stop that, mm -hmm. which was a really challenging decision, but that's what we made as an organization. Mm -hmm. And one of the tips and maybe commitments that I was going to bring to this group is I've been going to every one of our funders and specifically our for-profit business uh, corporate sponsors asking for multi-year commitments. So I'm no longer saying, I'd love for you to be a corporate sponsor this year at $5,000. I'm now saying, I really would love to hear and see how you can be committed for the next three years at a $5,000 level. And yes, if your budget can't bear it because of some catastrophic event like a pandemic, if we don't know what's happening in two years, mm -hmm. then fine. But we would love to be able to be more planful. And you as a community partner and a funder of ours, that will help us do that. And mm -hmm. so I, I think the more of us that start asking for those multi-year commitments, um, the less it will be like a, huh? You want me to, you want us to commit right. to years? Right. That's great. That's really, really, really helpful. I really appreciate that, Elise. Um, thank you for taking the time to share with us. It's um, just so grateful for that. Um, the third person I want to bring on is Donna Bissett. Um, she's the uh, Land Trust Program Co Coordinator for Maine Coast Heritage Trust. How are you today, Donna? Hi, I'm good. Hi, everyone. Great I'm to see you. Yeah, I'm really sorry that we're having to breeze through everyone, but um, our commitment with MAMP Connects is to get any, everybody in and out in 45 minutes, and we try to make these like really packed snippets of good information and connections. So thank you for being here, and I apologize to Elise and Keith and you in advance for having to keep things so brief, but we'd oh, love no, to No, no, it's great to hear. Great to hear from everyone. Um, and I, you know, I don't need a ton of time. I, first of all, I just, you know, I think, first of all, we're a little bit different in that we're, we are sort of an intermediary. Yes, we are part of a nonprofit, but we work with the over 80 land trusts in Maine who are themselves nonprofits. So we're sort of a service center to it. And you guys are a service center to a service center with us. Um, but I'm always just, uh, you know, in awe when I join these calls and hear about the amazing work that's um, happening in other sectors in in Maine. Um, 
certainly the staffing issue resonates strongly. We run a job board, a job board for um, any, and not just land trust, any environmental uh, related positions. We have listings from state agencies and other places. And I recently, uh, you know, was in a panic because jobs were disappearing from the the job site, and it was because we had reached our limit. We've never gone over wow. <laughs> 50 available jobs before. Um, and we are, we fixed that and we are now running 60 to 70 jobs. Um, and that is just a wow. huge increase for us. So we could talk about why that's happening. Maybe the word is getting out about the job board more, but I think really and truly there's a lot of um, demand for, I mean, and we see it everywhere we go, right? We see it at Target and, um, right, and, right. and McDonald's, right? You know, everybody is hiring. Um, we've seen quite a bit of consolidation over the last 20, 25 years um, in uh, land trust work where there were over 100 land trusts when I started um, doing this. There are now just over 80. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing consolidation. Um, and then a lot of just demand to be more professional. Um, about 15 years ago, uh, accreditation for land trusts started, and that was a huge challenge for land trusts, um, and actually a way that MAMP has been incredibly helpful to land trusts, because so many of the accreditation requirements are really about good governance um, and good finances and that kind of thing. So the services and the help that MAMP has provided has been a critical um uh, uh, help in that realm. And then, um, uh, well, I really liked what Keith said about the healthy tension between remote and in-person. I think that, uh, that's something at least at Maine Coast Heritage Trust that we're, we're really starting to see now that people are getting relaxed, more relaxed. Um, some people are coming into the office most days, and then you have other people who are only coming in one day, if that. And so it's just this, you know, as an organization, what where do you what do you set as set as the expectation? And I think that's where we're struggling a lot. Uh, well, not struggling a lot, but we're realizing we need to do some good thinking. Yeah. Um, and finally, just really quickly, um, DEI has certainly added a layer to the already full plates of land trusts. Um, it's, it's, I think they're, they're welcoming the challenge very much so, but it's still, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's still hard for boards that have a lot, a lot to do and a lot to think about to have, to add that to, um, to their, their, um, responsibilities. And, and again, MAMP, you guys are there offering a lot of really great webinars and resources. And I think, um, you know, I just, we got to keep, keep getting that uh, cross-cultural, you know, sharing with each other like we're doing here. So thank you for, for these calls and for all the ways that you help support that interconnectedness. No, oh, thank you, Donna. That's really helpful. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the work, the workforce issue that all of you have mentioned is just, um, it, you know, we're, st we're obviously just still very much navigating a whole new set of dynamics. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, you know, demand is going up and, and, um, and organizations like Elise's are becoming leaner because they want to make sure that they're providing competitive salaries. And yet there are or other organizations that are expanding and looking for more people and looking for more, you know, the, the, it's, a, it's overwhelming, the dynamics that are happening. And so this is really reaffirming to me because I, I'm really committed and interested in working with our team at MAMP to help everyone get a landscape view of, of what these dynamics are and how um, interconnected they are. And and um, making sense of that. And, and to Elise's point, um, really thinking through um, the messaging that we're sending about the, the professionalization of the sector. Um, in a lot of ways, I feel like our funders haven't, or some of the traditional ways that our revenue sources have perceived charity is not e equal to the output of work that's happening. 
and the level of professionalism and how we're handling these community-wide issues. And it hasn't equalized. There's some amazing work happening in Maine's philanthropic community through the Maine Philanthropy Center and um, through some of our business partners who we all know and work with, um, which is really provides a lot of hope and progress in that area. But there's a really long way to go. Uh, one of the issues that was, um, and Donna, if you, you can sit and chat with me or not, you're welcome to whatever you're comfortable with, um, staying on camera or not. Um, I, I didn't want you to feel like a trapped audience, but one of the things I did want to mention is, is that a topic that came out recently is that more and more people are putting their money into donor advised funds. And um, that that's great, right? Donor advised funds play a really critical role. And our friends at the Maine Community Foundation do a phenomenal job of of leveraging those resources to the benefit of the main of main communities. But someone pointed out to me recently, the challenge with that though, is that DAFs are hidden from fundraisers. Fundraisers can't see the DAFs. They are reliant on the Fidelity Charitable Investments or a main community foundation who does a really good job. But there are lots of places where people are holding their money that fundraisers don't have the opportunity to build those relationships. They have to wait. And um, the, the private family foundation, like we have such a great community of them here in Maine, have had that public face and, um, and make those opportunities to engage and network and develop relationships more, um, more transparent and more accessible. So we've, we've also got this uh, like nuance of funding challenges around, um, it's, it's getting more difficult to find. Like we know the money's out there, right? And it's getting more difficult to find. All of this stuff is so, so helpful. Um, I, but it is 943, that went by so fast. Thank you so much to Keith and Elise and Donna. Thank you so much for taking your time today. The chat box has been really full and active. I'm hoping that I know that we have such an amazing team here that I know everybody's been gathering all that information and will be digesting it. I wish I could hear from each of you individually. I really, truly wish I could. The best way that we can hear from you is through that survey if you haven't done it. But even if even if you have something burning, email one of us, email Anna, email me and even anybody on the team and let us know what's on your mind, because this this is really helpful to us to be able to distill the information that's coming in from all over and finding out and figuring out what's going to serve you the best right now. And that's really what we want to hear from you. And now I'm going to wrap up. I can't believe I have to do this. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being members of MAMP. If you know people who should be a member, send them to Anna. Um, if you uh, provide informational feedback, um, please, I already said, reminder, the survey comes out, it closes on Mar Monday, March 18th at 5. Um, also, don't forget to come to, oh, look, celebrating. Look, can I have some more cakes? Can somebody celebrate? Can I get some more birthday cakes, please? Um, and again, thank you to our sponsored Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and go blanket sales tax exemption. Keep it in the governor's budget. Let's make it equitable for all charitable nonprofits to be sales tax exempt. Okay, I think that's it. Anything else you want to wrap up with, Anna? No, you said it all. Okay, great. Happy Thank Friday, you. everybody. I hope this was a great, helpful program to you. We are on board to do more. Can't wait to see you again. Have a great weekend. Bye.